year 12. We've got the stage five material of lots of review of all the different ways of displaying data. We've got cumulative frequency, box and whisker plots, all that sort of stuff. We've also got the scatter plots. The new bit here that isn't in stage five is the Pearson's correlation coefficient. We use technology. I think technology is probably important and there are lots of opportunities here for doing your alternative assessment. But understanding the concept is really important. Don't get them using the technology until they have understood the concept. So this is my summary of what we've got in here. We've got the single variate data, which is basically all the different displays, and then two different sets of summary statistics. You've got your mean variant standard deviation family, and you've got your median quartiles into quartile range family. So you've got those two things going on, and I think it's important to perhaps spend lots of time with the students talking about that. Look, you've, is, is it this family we're talking about, or is it this family we're talking about? What are the differences between them? Why might I choose to use this family rather than this one? And of course, that's the road down which you can then start analysing data that's thrown at you and make sure that no one's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You know, why have you chosen to use that family to analyse it? What would happen if you used the other one instead? Bivariate data then as well, and we've got the displays themselves, the correlation coefficient formulae, and just looking at correlation in general and trying to see if there are any links. So, very briefly, because we know all this really, two-way tables are still there as well. We've got the link there with conditional probability, frequency, cumulative frequency, finding the median from cumulative frequency, and so on. We've got Pareto charts. They're new, but you might have been doing them in standard. I don't know. So we've got these Pareto charts. Um, they're used in business because it prioritises the things that are going wrong and helps you to deal with them better. So that's the reason they're there, is because they are used quite a lot in business. Um, one thing to note is we've always got concave down cumulative frequencies when we're dealing with that, just by the nature of how they're constructed. We've put into the book lots and lots of different types of charts for you to look at and consider, including your radial charts and so on, because I think it's important that they're just exposed to lots and lots of different um, types of ways of looking at statistics. So then... The first family, mean variation standard deviation. Well, we've just done all this, haven't we? So there's a link there. So actually, you could go through this quite fast if they've understood the standard deviation and everything you've just done in year 11, not just done, have done in year 11. We've got various things to be aware of with your histograms and your polynomials, making sure we're passing through the centre and so on. And something I just want you to look at for a moment here is look at the area of the histogram bars. Right, and now look at the area underneath the frequency polygon. And can you see by just flipping some of the triangles that it's the same area? And that's going to become important when we move on to the continuous probability. So just think, trying to make a few links like that as you're going along. So we've got our summation notation. This is what we've just been having, haven't we? But the F over N is the probability, basically. So it's the same thing again. We've had that, so we're all right with that. I spoke about the correction factor earlier, but just to point out the difference on the calculator, I'll actually just come back to it again then. If you are getting students to simply type some of this into the statistics part of the calculator, which isn't a wrong thing to do, as I say, as so long as you're sure they do understand why they're doing it, but to do it fast, in a hurry, use the calculator, teach the statistics mode and how to do that. There are two options. There is the sigma n, and there is a sigma n minus 1. And this one does not apply the correction factor, but this one does. So make sure they understand which one they're pressing. And you could, if you know, look, it depends how far you want to go. Do you want to teach them exactly why? Or do you just say, don't touch that button? That's fine. You know, just make sure they're pressing the right button is the main thing. Yeah. Um, and similarly, if we're using Excel, getting the difference between standard deviation S of a sample and a P, a population, which doesn't apply the correction, and this one does apply the correction, is important if you're doing any work in Excel and you're doing any projects on that. So just being aware of that. And you can get into some interesting discussions is a set of year seven spelling results a population or a sample? Well, it depends what we're measuring, doesn't it? Is it a sample of their spelling ability at that moment in time, or is it the population of the whole year group on this particular day in this snapshot at this moment? So you can have debates about, well, you've got to think about what am I trying to achieve by whether I'm going to consider this as a population or a sample. I'm going to talk to your people, higher echelons, about data analysis at the school. Right, then we've got the other family, median quartiles into quartile range making sure we're going from top right, top right, top right, top right, and rectangle, and so on. And this sort of business, which we know, so five number summaries and so on from stage five. Box and whisker plots, outliers. We've got this definition of an outlier, which goes across to standard. And we might be asked to do things like redraw the box and whisker plot without the outlier, 
what's that look like, and so on. Things that are interesting to talk about with these two families of statistics then is what's the differences, such as standard deviation is very sensitive to outliers, but the interquartile range isn't, for example. So do we want to deal with data that is going to be sensitive to outliers, or do we not? Depends what we're dealing with and what we're trying to show. So just getting some sort of understanding of that. And real life examples is a really good example to talk about that. Maybe, I mean, I don't know how relevant global house prices might be to a load of 16 year olds. Maybe a little bit, depending on their family situation, maybe more than you think. But trying to find some things that appeal to them in terms of the data that you're using. So then we've got the Pearson's correlation coefficient. So this is our bivariate data. So we're all used to perhaps drawing a scatter plot from lower down, but again, Go back and revisit your stage five programs. Did we brush over that or did we spend time on it? And we're going to introduce this idea of the Pearson's correlation coefficient R. And just the general idea is that if R is one, we've got a perfect straight line of dots all in a row, minus one straight line all in a row that way. And if, there's, if they're just randomly all over the place, then we've got zero. And everything else is a measure in between those things. So if I take a load of plots like this, then what I can do is I can do that and say, right, this one has got, I can actually put a measure on it and say how correlated these things are rather than just going, oh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I'm not sure. And we do that from the actual data. Yes, we, we, we might have some things that aren't linear. Let's not go there at the moment. Pearson's correlation coefficient is to do with linear correlation. Okay, so we're just sticking on that at the moment. Your science department will hate you for that, but hey. We're looking at line of best fit by eye, which is part of the syllabus as well. But line of best fit by eye is just about looking at it like that. But then we also want to be able to actually generate the equation of the line as well. So what we need to do is the officially, the official definition, it's the line that minimizes the square of the vertical distances from the points to the line, which is why it's called the least squares regression line. We might need to consider these things, except the bottom one. Let's not go there. Let's just leave that to the scientists. Okay, I think it's been taken out of the syllabus, that word now, hasn't it? Causation, I don't think it's there. But causation is best left to scientists, and I think we've actually said that about three times in the book, best left to scientists. So it's, it's, it's something for a good discussion, but we don't need to know about it from a mathematics perspective. So this is our formula. Okay, this is the Pearson's correlation coefficient formula. Let's look at what it's saying. It is the deviation from the mean in the x direction. So remember, it's a point, x, y coordinates. Deviation from the mean in the x direction and the y direction multiplied together. Multiplied together because, therefore, if they're both on the same side, either there or there, then that means you're going to get a positive result. And if they're on different sides, you're going to get a negative result. So it gives a better idea of why that's important. And then on the bottom, we need that to cancel everything out and so that it's a ratio. It's closely related to the standard deviation formula, but it's not the standard deviation formula. And don't get them confused. It's not affected by units and gradients because the units cancel out, so it is just a number. So when we're actually trying to work this out, we've also got the least squares regression line. Now notice this is subtly different to this. So it's just this bit because we already said it's just about in the x direction. So sorry about the difference there that way. So we've drawn a little picture here to help. And all of this is in the textbook, as I say. So you've got this idea and this idea, and we're using the line, actually I put the C in there, I changed that, and that needs to be a C as well, so as we've you get the idea, it's Y equals MX plus C, you guys are used to calling it B, it's actually a C here now. The numerator of this is the same as it is for R, back here. The denominator, we found that when we were calculating R as part of it, look here it is. And the value of B here ensures that the line passes through the mean point, because it should do that. And that's something you might want to have started teaching lower down the school. No reason why not. When you're drawing that random line of best fit, let's make sure it goes through the mean point. So here is an example that I'm not going to go through now of what you might do. Starting with this is the information you'd be given at the top, the X and the Y, and then from there we go and we create everything else and find everything else. Um, this was raised yesterday, wasn't it, that there was a slight uh, misalignment between this one and what's in the standard textbook at the moment but we're, we're busy sorting that out because it's not quite the same as what's in the standard textbook how we have classified the correlation being strong weak but I mean yeah but that is going to be ironed out so we'll sort that um, but just yeah it's, it's a bit subjective really isn't it as to whether it's strong or weak or anything hopefully they'll give ones that are pretty obvious which of those categories are going to fall into we don't have any guidance from Nessa on how they would do that so I doubt they'll probably expect you to do that exactly 
And then you're, you're at the end of this chapter, it goes through in great detail using technology and doing all of this stuff with technology. So this is a spreadsheet I just produced from following their instructions and it didn't take me very long at all. So they talk you through how to do it and then you could then take that and they've got lots of examples you could turn into some alternative assessments around that as well. Um, there's lots of work on large data sets, so this is taken out of here, there as well, and so on. Um, I was going to say, actually, that because um, I have taken these shots a little while ago, um, they haven't yet been nicely made pretty in the new font, so they're in the old font at the moment, but they will be in the new font when you get them. But it's, this is all content from the textbooks. So then we meet continuous probability distributions. So this is the last big topic in Year 12, that is statistics. So we're going to meet a continuous probability. Um, that's, again, a sort of flow chart of how I feel you'd go through it. You'll see that as I go through here. You've got it in close type there, you can see. But basically, what we've got is this idea of cumulative distribution. So the difference between saying what's the probability that x is a particular value and what's the probability that it's any value up to a certain point. So here... I'm calling it big F of X, and that is my cumulative distribution function. So big F of X is the function of naught, so all of it up to there, up to one, up to two, up to three, and I'm just adding them up as I go along, like cumulative frequency, only it's the probabilities instead. And the same would be true if I had it with frequency, and I've got my relative frequency, and then I'd have my cumulative relative frequency going along the bottom as well. So that's the idea of what the cumulative distribution function is. Why is that useful? Well, that's because I can then define this. So f of x is the probability that my x value takes x or less values. So it's up to that point for all x. And, so those, and that's the same thing, but for cumulative rather than the probability. So then on a continuous, what we've basically got then is in a particular interval... So if I was to draw a particular interval, I've got from A up to B. Here's A to B. Um, I'm saying that my value here of X, I'm saying what's the probability? The probability is that it's anywhere from there to there. And then I move the X out this way. Notice that the probability of it being naught, uh, sorry, probability of it being at this end is naught. The probability of it being this end is going to be 1 because that's all the possible values in the range that I'm talking about. So I'm only talking about a closed interval a, B. We already talked about this briefly, but just to remind you what I said earlier, that the area of these rectangles is the same as the area under that polygon. Okay, hopefully you'll see where I'm going with it, and the area is equal to 1. What's happened here is this is using relative frequency notice on here. Now I'm going to take a sideways step and talk about something seemingly unrelated, but bear with me. A chook wandering around a yard. Okay, so I've got a chook wandering around a yard, a circular yard, and I want to know, what, this has got radius 6, and the probability that it's exactly at any particular point is actually 0, because you can't ever be sure that it's at a particular point. But we could say, is it within a certain range from the centre? So using cumulative frequency, what I could say is, if that's x, what's the probability the chook is no more than x from the centre? So it's out as far as whatever x is. So if x is a particular value then I just work out the area of that inner circle, the area of the whole circle, it's one over the other. So the probability of the chook being no more than x from the centre is 136x squared. So I could actually draw that like this, couldn't I, there? So as f of x is adding up all those probabilities, the other place we have adding up lots of things is an integral. So what we've got is that the big f of x is an integral of a function which we call f, little f of x, and that that is the probability density function. That is the function that describes the probability over this range. And the integral is adding all of those things up. So to now put the mathematics in there, what I've then got is that to say that the probability of something x or lower, I can actually call that an integral. Notice I've used a t here just because I'm differentiating it and getting the x function. So if this is my thing and this is my probability, this is describing what's happening to the probability, so it's now continuous over that time, then the actual probability of it being x or less is the integral underneath that curve, the area underneath the curve, hence the link with the area underneath the um, histogram function. We have two things that must be true for a probability density function. We must have it being positive, 
we're not going to get confused with negative in, uh, areas and so on. And we must also have that the total is one, the total area in the interval I'm talking about, because probabilities have to add to one. So those two things have got to be true. Otherwise, it's not going to be a valid thing. So let's look at two examples. We've got a guy leaving, uh, he's, got, he's arriving at the train station. Trains leave every 15 minutes. And I want to know, what's the probability distribution if I arrive at a random time of what my rating time will be until I get on a train? So what I do then is I'd say, OK, I've got all the possible different times of how long I'm going to be waiting, up to 15 minutes. I won't be waiting more than that because there'll have been a train, assuming they're on time. Which means because I need the area under it to be 1, that means that I've got its 1 15th on the side. So this is just a constant function of 1 15th. So I can say that little f of x, my probability density function, is just a 15th from 0 to 15. And that means I can then say, well, f of x is the integral of that from x to 0. This is the second part here. I want to know um, what's the PDF. So I've found the PDF. The PDF is that probability density function, cumulative distribution function. No, I've got that wrong way around. Probability density function, cumulative distribution function. Don't get those the wrong way around. That's a bad idea. OK, so we're going to integrate that. We integrate it, and there it is. So this is my cumulative distribution function is x on 15, which is this. Now I'm asked in part B, what's the median and what's the 45th percentile? So the median will happen halfway through when my cumulative distribution function is adding up to a half. So I put my cumulative distribution function that I just found equal to a half and solve it for x. And for the 45th percentile, I'm going to put it equal to 0.45 and solve it for that. The final thing I'm asked there is what's the probability he will wait between 5 and 10 minutes? So what it's asking me is it's saying, OK, between 5 and 10 minutes. So I'm trying to work out this. What's the probability the x will be between 5 and 10? So I'm going to integrate from 10 to 5 my probability density function. And I just do it as a normal integral. So you can see why this is in year 12, because we've got to know all the integral stuff to be able to do this. Here's another example where I'm just given the function. So again, that was the more sort of like, here's a wordy problem, let's work out the maths. Here's one that's just do the maths. So here is my function. It's defined on this interval. Show that this is true. Well, I can do that. That's fine. OK, that's nothing different that I haven't done from a normal integral. So that's just do it. But then show nevertheless it's not a valid probability density function. So I need to go back and say, what were those two things for it to be a valid probability density function again? The integral had to be 1. Well, I just showed that. So that's not that one. The other thing is that it has to be positive all the time in that range. And it's not. So it's not positive the whole time. It goes underneath the x-axis. And therefore, it is not a valid probability density function. I've got, an, I've got another one. I've, I've gone nuts on in, um, examples for this. OK, good. So we've got um, a function y equals 2x. So I've drawn that. It said sketch the graph and check that it's always greater than 0. So it is. So it's, it goes that. Right. Also, I need to check that the area is 1 underneath it. So I just, it's a triangle. So I can work that out. And then check your result by integration. So I've also done that. I want to mark a point x on the diagram. And I'm using the area formula to show what that cumulative distribution function is. So I'm just showing that this area, if I put a general point x, I can show that it's this. And then finally, if we're trying to find the quartiles, then what we're going to do is you get the cumulative distribution function again, and you put it equal to a quarter for the first quartile, equal to a half for the second quartile, and equal to three quarters for the um, third quartile. OK? And then solve that for x. Then we come on to the mean and the variance for the cumulative distribution function. So this is where we can see, hopefully, a link between this formula and this formula. So instead of having the sum, this is actually where it's even more handy to have the summation notation, because that sort of looks like that ish, sort of, maybe. But it's easier to see the connection, isn't it, that the sum of those things of particular values is the same as the integral, and the integral being a sum of those values. And similarly here, I've got that I've got the sum of these is the same as the sum of these. And in the same way that I could prove that that was that, you can prove that this is this. So I've got very similar formulae, except now I am integrating rather than summing. But otherwise, it's the same. So if we go back to our chook, we've got that the cumulative distribution function is 1 over 36x squared. And therefore, 
I could then go backwards and work out what the probability density function would have been by differentiating. So that's what we've got to remember. A bit like you had, used to have to remember that you've got your acceleration and your speed and your... Um, the other one, distance, <laughs> mental block, and that you're differentiating, accelerating, and so on. The same idea here, cumulative distribution function, probability density function, integrate, differentiate, and getting that the right way around. So then we've got the mean, we just work out by doing this. So the mean is just, use the formula, it's the integral over the interval we're talking about. So in this case, it was from six to zero, because the radius of the circle was six, of x times the function, which we just worked out there. So we just do it, and the same for the variance. We're just going to apply it here. So you're just plugging these things into these formulae here. And again, don't ask me whether that's on the formula sheet. I need to look that up. It might be. The type of question we might have might start like this. Confirm that this is a valid probability density function. That's where we go back to those two rules. Is it positive over that range, and does the integral over that range equal 1? So that's what we're going to expect to see, I would have thought. Then find the expected value for it. So hold on, I've done that. I've checked that it's 1, and yes, it's positive because it's a square. So I know that it's positive all the time. Next, find the expected value. Well, I'm just applying that formula, x times f of x. Well, I was told what f of x is, so that's fine. Over this range from minus 1 to 1, done. So it's naught. Find the variance. Again, apply the formula. The standard deviation is just the square root of that. So I've done that. Last bit, calculate the integral from mu plus the standard deviation, which I just worked out, to mu minus the standard deviation of this to determine what percentage lies within one standard, uh, standard deviation of the mean. Because we're talking about it's one standard deviation above the mean, one standard deviation below the mean. We want to know what's the probability that it's in that range. So the area under the curve between those two values. So then we do that okay, by just actually substituting in the values we just found out. Standard normal distribution then, so building again, standard normal distribution, the bell curve, looking at this from a very different way from the way we look at it in standard. We need to look at actually what's the standard one. So the standard normal distribution is here demonstrated where this point here is this and this is my formula, yuck. And this is one of these things where we can't prove this at this level of maths. You know, we're, we're just, there are some things here we're just going to have to accept unfortunately, that's the way it is. Um, so we've got that. Notice z instead of x when we're looking at the normal distribution. We accept that this is true. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry that we do at this point. So that we're accepting that that area is 1. The mean is naught. Well, you can see that, can't you, from the fact it's symmetrical and that's where the peak is. And the standard deviation is 1 and minus 1. And notice that that's where the inflections are in the graph. So that's interesting that that's where the inflections always are in the graph here. So that's at one standard deviation from the mean. Which means that I could write this as the integral of this. Except how do you do the integral of that? Yeah, with a calculator, yes, thank you. <laughs> so what we do is we use a table of values, or we use a statistics calculator, or we use a spreadsheet, or we use statistics software. I don't know if any of you ever did statistics at uh, university, or you were somewhere in a, in a different country and did statistics there, but I spend a lot of my A-level looking up things on a table like this. Yeah, so you have to do a lot of that sort of stuff. So what we're saying is that this, which is how we notate, I'll write that bit bigger so you can see it. So we're talking about this, is the integral of my other, my, my normal distribution probability density function. So if this is something you really want to get your students used to, is this idea of the shading. So what this gives me is this gives me the probability of it being anything up to this point. So the probability of less than or equal to z, where the little z I'm talking about here. The area under the curve is 1, and the function is even, symmetrical. That's going to be important, because we're going to play with it. So it, here's an example. Work out or look up pz is less than or equal to 2. OK, so looking that up on this table back here, if I go back here, 2. Here's 2, point naught. So it's 0 0.9772. So from the table, p that z is less than that is this. And the, that is this area. That's what it looks like. 
So I know that the probability that it's less than 2 is 0.9772. So that means I could use that information to now answer all of these questions because of symmetry. If I know that this area here is 0.9772 and the total area is 1, then I can work out what this little bit here is, can't I? And by symmetry, I can, it's the same as that. And here I know, well, that's going to be half, so I'm going to take that off as well, and so on and so on. So you can play around with the areas under the curves. Once you've got one answer, the others all then follow. We've got the empirical rule, which is related to that. So the idea being what's one standard deviation from the mean, it's always going to be 68%. What's two standard deviations from the mean, it's always going to be 95%. So these areas are known. Again, I'm not sure if that's on the formula sheet. Is it on the formula sheet for standard? It is. Perfect. There you go. That'll help. Okay. So you've got those things on the formula sheet. And then we've got the general normal distribution. So you have the standard normal distribution, the general normal distribution, because, of course, when we're dealing with things in real world, and lots of things do appear in bell curves... It doesn't nicely happen that it peaks at zero all the time. It might peak somewhere else. So we've got to translate, transform the graph. <coughs> we've got to stretch it out by a factor of whatever the standard deviation is, which means, of course, that's all very well. So, that, so the inflections come at the right places where the standard deviations are. That means the area has been increased by a factor of sigma. So we've then got to divide by that. To bring, so we bring the y down so that we've still got the same area of 1 underneath. And finally, we've got to shift it all right so that it's actually sitting with the peak of the bell over the mean, the mu. So the formula now changes and becomes this, just simply by transforming it from what it was. So we've done our transformations of graphs, done them quite early, we've done them already. So we can now apply all of that and get this. So then, when we are working with the normal distribution, that is what z-scores are. So that is what the z-scores do is I'm taking it for anything, I've got to convert it to the standard normal distribution before I can apply the normal distribution rules to it. So it's taking a general dist normal distribution and changing it back to a standard normal distribution. And you may know something about the z-scores from doing standard, or you may just know anyway from some work you've been doing. So we're just taking the value, taking away mu, and dividing by sigma. Or if we're talking about a sample, we are doing x bar and s. So here's a classic example. What scores would be 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations from the mean? Remembering that one standard deviation from the mean could be above or below. And so we're just applying those and working those out. And how many standard deviations from the mean are particular scores? So you'd work out how many they are by just doing the same thing in reverse. So that's just working with those things. There are lots of investigation ideas in that chapter towards the end as well. There's a whole exercise on that, which, in fact, I think it's even a whole chapter on investigation ideas, which would be very useful at that point. Finally, then, Year 12, Extension 1. So, funny enough, we actually go back to some stuff that's covered in standard at the start of this with the binomial distributions, in that we're talking about this, and we're revisiting binomial theorem that we've done in Year 11, so we're just talking about the probability P and Q. We've got the idea of a Bernoulli trial, either it's a success or a failure. So it's only got two possible outcomes. So we've got that they add up to one. So basically we've got P and one minus P. And that a binomial experiment is where I do lots of Bernoulli trials over and over again. So if I define X as the number of successes with the order not being important, then I can write this. So I, this is my way of defining it. N is the number of times that I've done something, and P is the probability of success. So I write it, that sort of summarises what's going on in, the binomial in this particular binomial distribution, is that I've got it happening this time, many times, and this is the probability that it's going to go right for me. So a single Bernoulli trial is just one P, because it's only happening once. Here's an example where I have done the same thing as we did before. I've taken a table and then I've written it down like this, but I've written the number of sixes. And this time I've just worked out the probability using the binomial distribution. So we've got lots of combinations going on here. We've got this notation that we've met before the previous year when we were doing the binomial theorem. And I've said approximation because it's rounded off, but you get the idea, it adds up to one. This is my general formula, that the probability of X number of successes is going to be my ncx, p to the x, q to the n minus x. And we've got this sort of thing where we're just saying what's the probability we've got no defective bulbs, 
And then we could also have the probability that there are two boxes, two bulbs that are defective. So then the new bit is making sure we know how to work out the mean and the, sta and the standard deviation using these things. And there are formulae for those. So you've got your P and your NP, PQ, NPQ, depending on if it's Bernoulli or if it's binomial. Um, most of the time it would just be binomial with a certain number of Bernoulli trials. But if it's talking about a Bernoulli trial, it just simply means something where it either happens or it doesn't happen. And so we might have something like this. We've got the parameters N and P. What's the mean variance and standard deviation? We're just applying these formulae here. And what's the probability of getting the mean? So mean variance, standard deviation, plug in the numbers, use the formulae. What's the probability of getting the mean? Well, the mean was 2, so what's the probability x is 2? Well, that's applying that other formula that I had down here a minute ago. And what's the probability the result is within one standard deviation? So we work out what that is, because we know what the mean is, and we know what the standard deviation is, and then I just need to turn it into whole numbers. And then I work that out. This is the bit I want to get to. So, normal approximations to the binomial. The idea being that the binomial distribution, which is a discrete distribution that can only take certain values, can be approximated to the normal distribution and therefore do more interesting things with it and useful things with it, as you'll see in a minute, if it is a very large sample that we're taking, if n is very large, if we're doing it a lot. So the sort of thing we're looking at is here's a poll coming out of the election, quite important. Suppose we've got, they won a third of the vote in the last election, and we want to know that a set of results come in from this survey. We want to know what's the probability of that result coming in. So what's the probability that I've got a particular result, that I'm going to get a result between this and this if we've still got this true, that they won a third of the vote. So to work that out, I've got to do this, plus this, plus this, plus, you know, 100 different terms. So this would be an absolute pain to work it out, and I can't work it out. So I need to find another way of doing it. And the way of doing it is to approximate it to the normal distribution instead, and to deal with it. And so turning this that is actually a binomial distribution into the normal distribution. And I use this. So B, I've been writing as N, P. N is, is, is written as being the mean and the, stat and the variance. So I've applied the formulae using my NP, and I've got the mean and the variance there instead. But I've got to have big N to be able to do that. So let's do an example of that. So I've got a particular example, a coin costs 20 times. X is the number of heads. What's the probability the number of heads is greater than 12? And I'm going to do it both ways. So this is a relatively small N. N is 20. That's relatively small. So we're on the verge of whether this is really valid or not. But it's just going to illustrate the point. So using a binomial distribution, we do that. We just add up all the possible options, and we get 0.132, but it's still quite a lot of sums. Using the normal distribution, um, and I'm just going to point this out at that point, so I do come on to it again, but just so what I want to point out is that because it's discrete and I'm doing it by a continuous, I need to think about the area. If you go right back to the histogram and the area underneath, if we're talking about the area under a histogram, I've got the business that the frequency polygon starts from here, doesn't it? And so I apply something called the continuity correction, whereby I actually go back by half a unit before I start because of that problem of the fact that I'm approximating, a bit like the trapezium rule in a sense, I'm, I'm approximating under a curve, except it's not a curve because it's a discrete distribution. So the continuity correction I'm going to do in this case because I want to know at least 13 heads greater than 12, at least 13 heads, I'm actually going to do P X is greater than or equal to 12.5 because instead if I want to know from here in terms of the histogram, I need to know from here in terms of the frequency polygon. So I'm applying what we call the continuity correction at that point and going back one. Okay, so then I apply my Z score, I work out my Z score, I know what my mu is because it's n times p, and I know what my, standard, my variance is. So I'm going to apply those things down here, and I get my z-score. So I want the probability that z is greater than this z-score, which means, think if you remember our curve that does this, yeah, the probability of something being to that side of that line is going to be 1 minus it being to that side of our line, which is what the table gives us. So I'm doing 1 minus that, and then I use a table to look that up, and it's 0.881. And 
And so that's my answer, 0.119. OK. We'll do one other. So if we ignore the continuity, we're going to do this both ways. We're going to do it one way ignoring the continuity correction and one way using the continuity correction, just to show you. You can, you can do both ways, but most of the time the question should probably say using the continuity correction or not using the continuity correction. So I'm going to do this. This is the example we had back in the start of the poll. So we've got a poll of 10,000 people. And we're looking at what's the probability that it's between these two things. And if you remember, we had n was 10,000. That's how many people I was surveying. And the probability of them voting that way was a third. So mu is these things multiplied together, so that. And sigma applying this is that times that times two-thirds, so that. And that's the square root of that. Now I've got that, then I'm going to work out my z score for the 3,300 and my z score for the 3,400. So what I'm looking for is the probability that z lies between these two values, so on here. Now, I'm not actually going to do that because we're running short on time, but I mean, you, you would work out this bit and take it away from 1, and then you'd work out this bit and take it away from 1, and then you'd have to add them together. And um, there's probably a half in there somewhere that needs to come with. I'm not, I'm not doing it off the top of my head, but there'll be some playing with areas to get what you need there. So then applying the continuity correction, because I want the area on those histogram bars, I've got to go from just a butt below to just above. But everything else is the same. So then I do everything else the same. So I take this number and put it in here and work out the z score. I take this number and put it in here and work out the z score and draw the same picture for that. So that's all the continuity correction is. Don't get too bogged down in the continuity correction. It's just about knowing you go half a unit below, half a unit above. Okay? And then finally, I don't go into this in great detail, but just to talk about the sample proportion a bit. Sample proportion is basically an estimate for the probability. So it's very linked to the idea of relative frequency. So if we've got 2,000 people now and 700 of them vote for the Working Together Party, the sample proportion is 0.35. It's, it's the proportion of people based on that sample. So it's the relative frequency from that particular sample, hence the sample proportion. And so the probability, in theory, the big P, is the population proportion rather than the sample proportion. So if X is the binomial distribution NP, then we say that this P hat is the number of different values X can take over the total number of values that we've got, all to the total number of times we've done it all together. Sorry, the particular value X takes over the total number of times we've done it. And P hatted is a random variable. So then we can deal with that random variable like this, 20 people are surveyed, then p hat has got 21 different possible values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., and it's an estimate of that probability. So I can write this, that that is the same as that, and this formula we've just had with the binomial distribution. And if you're starting to worry again, it's all in the textbook, it's all there. I'm just giving you a whistle-stop tour of it. Finally, then, we've got similar formula to what we had before in terms of the, est uh, the expected value and the variance on those things with the sample proportion. And we can approximate it in the same way as we approximate by binomial distribution with large m by using this. Okay. One last example. I think I've just got one more example to go. So, binomial experiment with 20 Bernoulli trials to estimate the probability of a Bernoulli experiment. So the actual value of P is a third. What's the probability we'll get an estimate within 0.05 of the actual value? So because this P hatted can only take these values, if you've got 20 times it's happening, to be within 0.05 of this, so we're trying to say the actual value is this. We want to see, will the sample come out as being close to that? So it's a way of checking how, how good your sample is, basically. So if it's going to be within 0.05, then it can be this one or it can be this one. Those are the only two ways it's going to happen. Everywhere else, it'll, if, if it's any other of those values, any other of these values, it'll be too far away. So it's either that or that. So what I want to know then is what's the probability that the sample proportion is 6 twentieths or the sample proportion is 7 twentieths. And so I work that out using my binomial distribution. But not my binomial, it's just my binomial theorem. I've finished. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes, absolutely.